Welcome back to the Digital Health and Wearables series. Today I have another magnificent episode and guest for you. But before I go ahead, let me remind you to subscribe to the channel. Also check the previous content there for you and share with your contacts and communities in healthcare. Also let me acknowledge our partners, our series partner Fujifilm Healthcare and our industry partner Isaac Care. But today gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Malia Fang. She is the founder at the POV. Malia, how are you? I'm really good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for accepting the invite to be here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I know that we kind of met over Twitter and we talk about a lot of the same stuff. So it's it's great to, to be here. Brilliant. Great to connect. And today we have a fantastic topic. The topic is digital health for your vagina. I would at least say it's very innovative and unusual. So uh, the first question that I have for you is, what is Femtech and how is it part of digital health? Yeah, so Femtech is a term that I believe stands for female technology, which it's an interesting term because female technology makes you think of all technology related to females and really when people refer to femtech they're talking about tech that has to do with our reproductive system so it's not a perfect term but if you hear someone talking about femtech they're talking about tech that pertains to the female reproductive system typically and of course Sometimes I don't like the term because, of course, like females are more than our uterus. Like that's kind of the problem, isn't it? Um, but anyway, it's an imperfect term. Now you know what it means. But some femtech falls into the very broad category of digital health. So, for example, a service that allows folks to order and manage their birth control online independently, that is both femtech and digital health. But femtech can also include items kind of outside of the space of digital health. For example, a new type of speculum, which is the device that is used for pelvic exams and pap smears to open the vaginal canal so that the doctor can see the cervix. Uh, there are some new devices that are more comfortable, less pinchy, less cold. Those are also part of femtech. And then finally, femtech can encompass more consumer products like organic tampons, which are all the rage right now. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Molly, for that fantastic overview and also the connotation around the terminology because the terminology, Femtech is a new uh, trend yes. and also it is very broad, but in a sense, your explanation was great because I always associate with women's health, not just the reproduction system, but is an overall arch. But thank you so much for making sense of Femtech. Um, the second question that I have for you is, what are some of the biggest challenges faced by the femtech community? Absolutely. So I want to talk about two types of challenges. The first is financial and the second is medical. So starting with financial, I think it's fair to assume that in most cases, the right founder of a femtech company is going to be someone who identifies as a woman or at least someone who has a vagina. Not in all cases, but in most cases. The problem with that is that women receive less than 4% of venture funding despite starting more than 30% of companies. And those metrics look much worse for women of color, trans women, and also just women who don't have a male co-founder or male on the leadership team. So I don't have a metric here, but in my own experience, it is very difficult to get traditional investors to get excited about femtech. I mean, when I was out pitching my first business idea, typically the response that I got from a lot of venture capitalists was, yeah, okay, I'll ask my wife. And it's like, okay, that's, unless your wife is an OBGYN that practices in a diverse community, she probably doesn't represent all of the female experience. And that's not really 
the right response to me explaining this new innovative product. So of course, femtech founders are at a huge disadvantage in bringing truly new innovative products to market because a lot of times they can't get the funding. And then we also have medical challenges, which in some ways are even more difficult. So we still have deep seated bias in the medical community itself against women and vagina owners, which can make it challenging to improve care. We know that women and uterus owners face misogyny in the health system. They're less likely to have their pain be taken seriously. Diagnosis of serious conditions like heart conditions takes longer. I mean, the list goes on. This has been proven over and over. So when you're trying to create a new care model for women, I mean, you need to work around all of that. And then the, another thing that kind of plays into that is that the female body just hasn't been studied very much. Women and minorities didn't even have to be included in clinical research until 1993. Like the medical model for what most of clinical research is based around is a male uh, biological model. And women then are treated as just like smaller versions of that. Uh, but women are not small men. Uh, so if you look at like WebMD, for many common uterine conditions like endometriosis or fibroids, you'll notice the same phrase that pops up over and over again, which is, we don't know what causes this. It, it might be genetic. <laughs> so when it comes to femtech, we're working off of very limited information here. And sometimes the evidence-based options are really minimal. Brilliant, uh, thank you. Um, Malia, you highlighted some really important factors and um, items there. I mean, from an outside, I'm in the industry. I, I, I'm not an expert in femtech, but I oversee the industry. And from an outside perspective, you would perceive that femtech is a new trend, very easy to find fa uh, funding, everybody's doing things. And these barriers that you highlighted are real. And also there are extra challenges. They are normal, let's say, what's normal, but normal digital health startup with a mix of founders. And uh, But at least I'm seeing one thing which is very exciting. More female founders behind the companies. It's your case as well, which is fantastic because it's great for the industry. And also you have your own experience and you you have this backing from the heart, from the right place. I mean, you innovate from the right place. But you also gave us a, a very comprehensive lesson on the medical side about the development and the research of the female body and the female as a whole. So, and you are underrepresented in, in the medical field as well by, by what you said. So, so many important things here. Uh, the yeah. third and last question that I have for you is, can you give some examples of wearables in femtech, women's health, please? Absolutely. I definitely wanted to do that because I know that you are the wearables expert and I want to get your take on these. So there are pretty much two types of wearables that are super popular in femtech right now. And like you've said multiple times, femtech is a newer trend. So I think we'll see more wearables come out uh, in the near future. But the first area that seems to be really popular is fertility tracking. So there are a variety of devices that can be either worn on your skin or sometimes inside of your vagina that track temperature, cervical mucus, other factors. That information is then transmitted to your phone and you can use it to either try to become pregnant or try not to become pregnant. Uh, so. I'm seeing a lot of innovation around wearables in that sense, even things like smart tampons, which can also fall into that category. And then another area I'm seeing is like menstrual care as wearables. So you stick them on or put them on your body in some way, and they can not only provide heat to soothe cramping and pain associated with the menstrual cycle, they might even have CBD or other remedies infused in them. They may collect data. I mean, it's we're really at just the beginning of wearables and femtech, uh, but those are some of the most common ones I've seen, and I would love to see more wearables in femtech. Sure, no, fantastic. Thanks for those uh, magnificent examples. I always remember I went to a digital health conference in Stockholm in Sweden a few years ago, and um, 
a Swedish company than actually a wearable for uh, the femtech industry it was very early on. I think it was about 2016 or 2017. And it was really, uh, well, a, a brilliant a new thing. They became quite big uh, in the next three, four years. Uh, raise a lot of capital and enter the US market and everything. But I am with you. Uh, uh, we are a kind of at the beginning of that journey. At least the the industry is populating more with some uh, novel technologies, but also companies doing similar things, which it takes time because is is all is all new. Thanks for those great uh, examples. Malia is a is a phenomenal phenomenal and also very exciting uh, uh, topic. Uh, innovative, I mean, educational, I mean, in, very interesting uh, from, for, for those in the industry, and I believe even for those not in the industry, I appreciate that uh, you are here. I would, I, I would never expect when I started the YouTube to do a digital health series and uh, talking about the vagina, but it's a very important topic. You, you, you know, it's, um, it's part of the woman's body and this woman's health. So health, digital health, vagina. So <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you so much for being in here. Uh, uh, my goal when I started the YouTube channel was to create this big community, uh, create the largest a healthcare uh, channel in the world by bringing innovators, cover all topics, represent um, the industry from thought leaders, uh, startups, big tech companies, public health, innovators, and I, and you fit really, really well in, in that in that category. So once again, th thank you so much for being in here. Thank you, and I appreciate you. You know bringing me on to speak about this topic and get it out in front of more people. You know, femtech is not just interesting to women, it's interesting to everybody. And also, you know, I kind of am a non-traditional founder and, or innovator, and it, it's great to be kind of featured on your channel alongside other top innovators. Brilliant. Malia, I finish all my uh, uh, episodes in a peculiar way. It's not a question as such. Okay. I'm not sure if you check other uh, guests. It's called One Minute of Fame. You can talk about anything related to the topic, uh, professional achievements, about more about the POV, your startup, um, um, personal interests, anything whatsoever uh, to round up. Over to you, One Minute of Fame. Yes, thank you. Well, I definitely want to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about what the POV or the POV is. We go by both. We are both advocates for change in the state of reproductive <coughs> care for people with a vagina, as well as a service that connects women and people with a vagina to the right health services and providers for them, really focusing around digital health access. The reason I want to talk about that now is we are up against an election here in the US. I'm sure you have many listeners from all over the world. But for those of you who are in the US, please get out and vote, especially young people. We don't do a great job of voting. This is a critical time. Women's reproductive care and the rights of women are on the chopping block, and we really need every single vote. So would really appreciate you showing up. Brilliant. Fantastic message. And also, uh, Malia, all, all the best for your innovation with the, the work with the POV and the things that you are doing because you're pushing forward a very important side of the industry and the representation, not just women's health, but you you might not realize this, but you are also not just a leader innovator, but you're covering several aspects of the digital health industry, a female founder, an advocate mm -hmm. for health, yeah. an advocate for change. So I really like that because I, 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 I do different things too, you know, and I try to mm -hmm. kind of help others. Of course, I have my own interests, but I try to help others and create a bigger community for everybody. So amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Malia, I'm going to round up now one last time. Thank you so much for uh, being in here. Thank you. Thank you. To all our viewers and listeners, uh, let me remind you to subscribe to the channel to get all this magnificent content every week. Also, make sure you follow uh, Malia's uh, work with the POV. I'm going to post the social media and the LinkedIn profile in here. Ask her questions, connect with her, 
And uh, to all our viewers and listeners, let me acknowledge our series partner, Fujifilm Healthcare, and our industry partner, Isaac Care, and I'll see you all next week.